The last two years, I've followed Robin Shute and his team, the Cindy Club, at the Pikes Peak Hill Climb Race, and for those two years, they have been faster than everyone else there. Robin has actually been King of the Mountain three of the last four years, and the one year he wasn't, it's because he didn't show up. I have detailed all of their secrets in two videos, and here again today, and yet none of you have taken this info and used it to make a faster, more Cindy car, so they're probably going to win again. Should I even bother to drive all the way to Colorado and wake up at unholy hours of the morning to drive up the mountain and make another video where the Sandy Club encounters some obstacles and has some failures, only to overcome them to be the fastest up the mountain? Again? Yeah, why not? But this time we're going to find some other cool cars. Electric cars. Motorcycle-powered cars. Truck cars. And a really weird battle for the diesel-powered record. <laughs> I love race cars, just barely more than I love sleep, so it's always tough to set the alarm clock for 3 a.m. to get to the mountain for practice mornings leading up to the race, although the sunrise is very nice. The race is held in June every year when the weather is usually nice, usually, but also wildly unpredictable. Last year, fog crept in, obscuring the top and slowing everyone way down. The year prior, a flash snowstorm shut down the top of the mountain, shortening the race course. This year, heavy snowfall in the winter left the top snow-capped all the way into late June. Even when the weather cooperates, the race is formidable. The course starts at a higher altitude than any racetrack in the world and then climbs almost a mile from there to the top of the tallest mountain on the southern front range of the Rocky Mountains. At that altitude, the air is very thin, making it difficult for both race car drivers and their cars to breathe. The low pressure decreases the power output of an internal combustion engine by a third. It makes it a lot harder to keep the engines cool, brakes will overheat faster, and aerodynamic downforce doesn't work unless your wings are really big. Racers have found solutions to these problems, but sometimes these solutions create their own problems. Everybody has their own ideas on what the solutions are, so you end up with cars that are all different, engine setups that are unique, and drivers and engineers who are all a little bonkers, but in the best way. I guess we'll start with the Cindy Club, even though we all know they're going to win. I'm actually kind of excited for the team this year because the weather is looking good, the car is looking good, and it's faster than it's ever been. So, with some luck, they have a shot at some records. The fastest car ever on the mountain was a huge multi-million dollar Volkswagen factory effort back in 2018 with a time of 7 minutes and 57 seconds. The Cindy Club sector times and practice have been looking pretty close. It'll be tough to break that outright record, but it's possible they could be the fastest internal combustion car with some luck. But I'm getting ahead of myself. The weather is clear so far, but the road at the top is bumpy. Snow melt could leave parts of the course wet, and it's hard to get traction on the pavement cooled by the surrounding snow. The day before they left for the mountain, the team took the car out to Willow Springs Raceway to test and tune at the streets of Willow Course. They ended with a lap time six seconds faster than they had ever run before and nine seconds faster than any posted time they could find. <laughs> It's not an officially timed lap record, but it might be the fastest car ever around that track by a lot. Of course, racing never goes that smoothly, and when they got to the mountain, one of their upgrades for the year started causing more problems than it fixed. The team used a turbocharger to make up for the thin air at elevation. A turbo uses the energy in the exhaust gases to force air into the intake. Here's the problem. When you slow down for a corner, your engine stops spitting out hot, explodey exhaust gas, which makes the spinny part of the turbo slow way down. When you get to the exit of the corner and mash down the throttle, the turbo has basically stopped spinning, so you're not forcing air into the intake, you don't accelerate, and you lose. Last year, the team mitigated this by changing the ignition timing so the engine just kind of spit fire right into the exhaust. This year, the team added air injection directly into the exhaust. This works better at keeping the turbo spooled up and ready to go on corner exit. But you do have to tune it, and you can't really do that until you get to the thin, high-altitude air on the mountain. At first, it wasn't great. It wasn't keeping the turbo spinning. But then, after some corrections, it was too good. The anti-lag wasn't balanced well with traction control. Robin hit the throttle on corner exit, lit up the tires, and spun the back end out. He dumped the clutch to get back up to speed, but that broke something in the drivetrain. We all waited in the pit area for the car to come down, worried that it was something serious, a transmission input shaft, or a gearbox filled with metal shards. But it was just the axle, the part of the CV joint that attaches to the wheel. Actually, this was the only thing securing the wheel on, so after the spin and the tow home, the only thing keeping the wheel on was hopes and dreams. That and the friction of the pins. Easy fix, not that bad. Last year they caught on fire, so, you know, step in the right direction. Further tuning of the anti-lag system had it working well, but since the turbo was always spooled up and always had flame shooting through it, the intake temperatures got really high. So they mocked up a cold air intake, went to the hardware store, bought some materials, and made it happen. 
This is one of the team's superpowers. There are always problems at the racetrack, especially Pikes Peak. The Cindy Club is excellent at identifying a problem, deciding on a solution, and executing it cleanly and quickly. I would have just drilled holes in the side with a hole saw, but that's probably why they don't let me touch the power tools. So, some minor challenges, but nothing they couldn't handle. This is going to be a short video. Let's look at some other cars. If these two cars look kind of similar, it's because they're both the same car, or at least mostly the same. They're both Wolf GB08 sports prototype cars. This one is driven by Dan Novembre. Dan is a Pikes Peak local who's been racing here for 15 years. His pit crew is his family and friends, in-laws and kids. Fantastic people. Also, fantastic car. If you watch this channel, you know I'm somewhat of a connoisseur of motorcycle-powered cars. I love them. I own two of them. And the only thing better than a car with a motorcycle engine is a car with two motorcycle engines. Two motorcycle engines bored out and grafted together into one 2.7 liter V8. It sounds wonderful. <laughs> Dan is running naturally aspirated, no turbo, no supercharger, not even nitrous, just a 10,500 RPM 32 valve V8 like God intended. This engine makes about 370 horsepower at sea level, unfortunately that drops to about 220 at the top of the mountain. But it's a lightweight car and Dan can drive, so he managed to qualify second behind Robin in the Unlimited class this year. It's a blast. It actually drives more like a go-kart than a car. So I really love how it handles. It's nimble. They make a 3.2 liter version of this Hayabusa and that's one of the targets about getting a, a little bit more power because up top it does it does you know suck air. Uh, it, it, I miss the turbos from that standpoint, but the drivability of this package is really nice. Part of the reason Dan wants that larger V8 is so he can try to drive the fastest naturally aspirated car on the mountain. That record is currently held by the former driver of this car, which is just wonderful. I love this car. If Robin's car is James Bond, this car is Rambo. It's brute force. They use mountain bike shocks to flatten out the wing at speed. The fuel tank is tilted so all the fuel collects at the corner where the pickup is. It's carbureted. It's an old school Ford 405 V8. Remember how I said Robin's car was the fastest car on the mountain three of the last four years? Well, that one year it wasn't, this car was. It was driven by Clint Vashholtz. This year, the car is being driven by Clint's son, Cody Vashholtz. The Vashholtz family has been out here setting records for 50 years. This car was built back when the course was more dirt than pavement. I appreciate drawing things out in CAD and looking for the scientific answers, but if you watch my videos, you know I also love to lean on intuition and experience. There are some things you can only know through experience, and this car and family has all the experience. This is probably the most interesting thing going on at Pikes Peak this year, the battle for the diesel record. It has three incredibly interesting cars driven by three very unique people. There's a Nissan GTR with a 6-liter power stroke, a Radical with a triple turbo Volkswagen TDI, and a street legal truck from 1949 called Old Smokey. We'll start with Old Smokey since it and its driver, Scott Birdsall, currently hold the record. Occasionally, you'll get a Big Bucks factory back team at Pikes Peak. This truck did not come from one of those teams, but it did take the record from one of those teams. Mercedes-Benz showed up in 2015 with a C300 D4-matic and set a time of 11 minutes and 37 seconds. Birds all showed up two years later with Old Smokey, but engine failures, a crash, and bad weather kept Scott from getting a good run until 2020 when he set the current diesel-powered Pikes Peak record of 11 minutes and 24 seconds. The truck is a 1949 Ford F1, or rather a tube frame race car wearing the weathered body of a 1949 Ford. The engine is a 6.7 liter inline 6 Cummins diesel. They actually sleeve the engine down to 6.4 liters to get extra strength in the cylinders so they could boost it to the moon. It's fed with a compound turbocharger setup pushing in over 100 pounds of boost. Each turbo has its own intercooler and the system is further cooled with water and methanol injection. The engine is currently tuned for about 700 horsepower, but that can be dialed up to around 1300 with a switch. Power is sent through a Dodge 47RE 4-speed automatic transmission. In total, the truck weighs about 4,400 pounds, with about a third of that coming from the powertrain. Last year, in an attempt to best his own diesel-powered record, Birdsall brought a diesel-powered CG Superlight LMP1, a sports prototype race car that should be much faster than the old Ford. Unfortunately, the mountain decided that no records would be set in 2022 as heavy fog obscured the top of the mountain. The engine was a 3-liter V6 Eco Diesel. The chassis was upgraded and cooling capacity was increased. Unfortunately, the team had trouble with the engine a couple of days before they had to leave for the race and they didn't have time to fix it. So Scott is back defending his record with the old Ford truck he set it in. 
probably one of my favorite cars at Pikes Peak. You know what? Actually, undoubtedly, one of my favorite cars at Pikes Peak is this Nissan GTR belching black smoke. Some of you might be concerned that it's on fire, but don't worry, this GTR is supposed to do that. We have a Ford Power Stroke powered Nissan GTR. It's a diesel, and not just any diesel. It's a 6 liter Power Stroke diesel. It's huge. It has two turbos. Its name is Frank. It's being driven by Cole Powelson, who told me all about it, including how it came to be. We started making jokes and an April Fool's joke turned into a, hey, maybe we could actually do this. And we scanned the engine, scanned the chassis, they fit. We saw an opportunity to go after the diesel record. This engine was never designed for a race car, and making it work was a challenge. The oil system wasn't set up for the high g-forces of cornering and acceleration, and keeping everything cool requires a lot of work. They learned this the hard way. The car showed up last year and blew a motor in qualifying due to oil starvation. The team worked around the clock to get the second engine for race day. Unfortunately, they ran into the same issue and failed to finish. But they came back this year with a lot of upgrades. Last year we had a single pressure. Now we have a dual pressure. We increased scavenges. Uh, we increased pump size and uh, the routing and plumbing of different components. We increased the cooling capacity. We've upped the threshold of grip to where it starts to lose oil pressure, but it's not good enough for what the car can pull and what the car can achieve. And so I'm driving around a lot of parameters that the, really dictated by the sensors on the engine, not what I feel is max grip as a driver. Another big challenge of this engine is keeping it cool. Radiators reject heat mostly through forced convection, just shoving lots of air through them. Only a tiny amount of heat rejection comes from actual radiation. That's why engineering professors get mad when you call them radiators instead of heat exchangers. As you go up in altitude, the air is thinner, so there's less air to shove through the heat exchanger, so you need a bigger heat exchanger and more of them. The GTR has eight, a transmission cooler, an intake cooler, three oil coolers, and three engine heat exchangers in the back. Another way to keep things cool is with nitrous. Lots of nitrous. A big benefit of nitrous oxide comes from the phase change. When you spray nitrous into your intake, it changes from a liquid to a gas, absorbing a ton of energy from the surrounding air and cooling it down. On a diesel, it also helps to run leaner with more oxygen and less fuel, which helps to further cool the engine down. One thing not helping Frank get up the mountain is its weight. The engine and transmission weigh about 1,200 pounds together, which is more than some whole cars at Pikes Peak. The extra weight shifts the balance forward, so about 62% of it is sitting on the front axle, though Cole says it's not that noticeable. I don't know if it'll break the diesel-powered record, but I love it. On the other end of the weight spectrum is this car, a Radical SR3 with a Volkswagen TDI four-cylinder diesel. The engine weighs about twice as much as the Hayabusa motorcycle engine that originally came in this car, but the total vehicle weight is nearly a third of the GTR, coming in at about 1,800 pounds. It's owned and driven by Greg Blachon. Greg has been racing on the mountain for about a decade and has previously competed with this immensely cool diesel-powered Volkswagen Beetle. Greg is an engineer, so naturally the powertrain is simple. And by simple, I mean not simple at all. There are two problems with the way turbos make power. One is that they work in a somewhat limited RPM range. The other is that they take some time to spin up and make power. You need a small turbo for low engine speeds and a large turbo for high engine speeds. A lot of people do this. The GTR does this. It's a pretty good solution. Two turbochargers are better than one. But wait a minute. If two are better than one, then what's better than two? Seven turbo... No, I'm just kidding. It's three turbochargers. You don't normally see this because it's complicated, not so much complicated in how it works, but complicated in how it's controlled. Greg uses turbo speed sensors, engine cylinder pressure sensors, and a custom engine control unit. Turbos like to work in a specific range, a limited area of flow, speed, and pressure. If you can measure all of that and you have three turbos, you can vary the exhaust flow to each one of them to keep them all happy. On top of that, you can always divert a little bit of flow to the small turbo to make sure it's always spinning. So when you come out of that corner exit and mash down on the throttle, you immediately have all the power you need. The turbo speed sensor was capable of managing the, the transfer of the flow. When that feature became available, I was like, wow, this is common sense. You know, you want that target RPM, you want to keep it pulling no matter what. And at a given RPM, we can transfer the flow. You can manage how much you bypass it. The turbochargers have water-cooled compressor housings and titanium compressors. Greg is also measuring cylinder pressure in each cylinder. Cylinder pressure along with RPM is one of the most direct ways to measure power. So all the parameters can be tuned and controlled to get peak power, and with the turbo controls, the engine can basically be at peak power all the time. It's crazy to drive. The car is way faster than me. You know, I'm not a race car driver, I'm just like an engineer that found a little technology going on. The transmission is a dual clutch and is automatically shifted. That's right, all three of these diesel race cars are automatics. 
Greg doesn't like to call it an automatic transmission, but the car does only have two pedals. Greg has been chasing the diesel record for years. In 2020, he went faster than the previous record, but so did Scott Birdsall and Old Smokey, who beat him by one second. The next year, the course was shortened by bad weather at the top. The year after that, heavy fog obscured the top, slowing everyone down. This year, Greg has timed himself in practice sessions and is so far faster than any other diesel in all sections. So it's looking good, but you can't win practice. And Greg knows as much as anyone, the mountain has a way of surprising everyone. Electric cars have a few advantages for time attack races like Pikes Peak. They have a lot of torque down low, so they accelerate very quickly, which helps on all the low-speed corner exits. And you have massive amounts of power coming from relatively small motors. There are, however, a few disadvantages. One big one, really. The battery size. Driving uphill at full tilt for 10 minutes uses a lot of battery. The Tesla race cars on the mountain use the majority of their batteries to get to the top. That's hundreds of pounds of batteries. When the Volkswagen beat the record, some people pointed to it as proof that the EV was better and better suited for a race at Pikes Peak. EVs might be a better experience for a lot of people, but I think the record here has more to do with the millions of dollars that Volkswagen spent on the effort. This year, Ford spent millions of dollars on an EV, so I guess we'll see if Ford's money is better than Volkswagen's money. Ford showed up with a van. The word van needs quotes around it. It's a pretty cool car, or van. It has three motors, making a total of 1,400 horsepower of all-wheel drive. It can pull 600 kilowatts during regenerative braking. That's 800 horsepower on regen. For comparison, that Volkswagen IDR only made 670 horsepower propelling it forward. They call this the Ford Supervan 4.2 since it's the second iteration of the Supervan. It's lighter and faster and has a lot more aerodynamic shenanigans that result in about 4,400 pounds of downforce at 150 miles per hour. Most of this car, including the drivetrain, was developed by an Austrian company called Stard. It has their six-phase motors and their custom battery with lithium polymer NMC pouch cells. The previous version of this van had a 50 kilowatt hour battery, but the team was a little cagey about the size of the battery in this one. There isn't a ton Ford about this super van, so Ford probably needs some quotes around it too, but who am I to get in the way of Ford's marketing team? They brought out huge power packs, two big lithium ion batteries that were a combined 300 kilowatt hours and capable of 60 kilowatts of charging. They also had another four at the bottom of the mountain, just in case. There was a rumor going around the pits that Ford had spent $7 million on this version of the car in the Pikes Peak effort, which is pretty wild considering most of the teams out here are operating on less than 1% of that. This is mostly a grassroots race. This guy didn't even have a trailer. He just drove his race car down the mountain at the end of the day. Some people are saying the van has a chance to break the overall record, but my guess is it's too heavy to navigate the corners faster than the Volkswagen IDR. Of course, this video will be coming out after the race, so if they do break the record, I can just edit this part out of the script and you'll never know. This thing is super cool. It's an electrified Sierra. Sierra makes these cool little cars, or carts, I guess. They're usually powered by a Hayabusa motorcycle engine and weigh about a thousand pounds. They look like a blast to drive. This one is powered by a Hypercraft built electric powertrain. It comes in a little bit heavier than the gas powered version, but still super light at about 1500 pounds with the driver. Aside from the powertrain, the car is nearly identical to its gas powered sibling with some changes and springs for heavier battery and some more attack angle dialed into the rear wing. The motor is a Cascadia Motion IM225 coupled to a Sadev gearbox. Battery on it's a 20 kilowatt hour battery. Uh, we're running INR 40T cells on it, which is a 21700 cell. Control electronics are done through AEM. We're using the VCU 300 with the custom firmware from them, and then calibration done by Hypercraft as well. It has about 350 horsepower at the wheels. That's a ton for a car this light, especially with the low-end power of an electric powertrain. I mean, it just got a lot of beans. I don't know what to say other than, like, it goes fast and it's fun. All that stuff I just talked about, all the fast sector times, all the upgrades and horsepower numbers, none of it matters. Doesn't mean anything. The only number that matters is the time it takes to get to the finish line on race day. You could have just skipped the entire video up until this moment. You just wasted like 15 minutes. The race sold out this year. It was packed. I don't want to take all the credit, but it's probably all those videos I've been making. The weather was great all the way to the top of the mountain. The top was a bit slippery from dust and cold pavement, but the times were looking great. Dan Novembre finished in 9 minutes and 27 seconds, almost half a minute faster than his previous best. An excellent time from a great team. And it might have been the fastest time for a naturally aspirated car, but shortly after, Cody Vashholtz screamed up the mountain for a time of 9 minutes and 19 seconds, breaking his dad's old record. 
As for the diesel record, Cole Powelson in that GTR beat the old record by 18 seconds, but not before Greg Blachon demolished it, finishing 40 seconds faster than that and almost a full minute ahead of the previous record. This time, the scalpel beat the sledgehammer, and the new time is going to be tough to beat. The reigning champion, Robin Shute, once again set the fastest time on the mountain, a personal best of 8 minutes and 40 seconds. He didn't break any records, the top was a bit slippery and brought his top sector time down, but for a fourth time, he was king of the mountain. The Sendy Club did it again, cementing themselves as one of the great teams. Just like we all knew they would. They're too good. It's almost getting boring at this point. We're gonna need more car fires and engine failures to spice it up, guys. Ford came in second with an impressive time of 8 minutes and 47 seconds, good enough for a record in the Pikes Peak Open class. A pretty cool van, and pretty fast. But in the end, not as fast as Robin Shute. I can't help but think if a car company gave the Sendy Club $7 million, they would have the outright record, and also $6 million. Teams are already talking about next year. Scott Birdsall might bring back the LMP diesel to try to take back his record. Novembre might get that bigger motor, and I'm sure Robin will be back with a few improvements to defend the title. But 2023 is in the books. And there it is. Now you have all of the secrets of speed from the fastest team on the mountain. In three videos, I have told you all about their engine, their turbocharger, the anti-lag. I told you all about the wings and the under tray. I even showed you step by step how to make the steering wheel. Now you have all the secrets of several other teams as well. I expect to see all of you here in 2024 with your record-breaking cars. Tune in next year for another exciting episode of Matt Lives in His Car for an Entire Week. Thanks for watching. Normally this would be where I tell you to subscribe, but I'm not going to do that this time. This time I'm going to suggest you go to the Sendy Club and subscribe to them. They have a ton of good videos, interviews, Streets of Willow track test. They'll have the full onboard of Robin's Race Up the Mountain. If you made it this far into the video, it's probably right up your alley, so check it out. Also, I love making these videos, but this type of video I usually lose money on, so if you have a couple extra bucks lying around a month, consider joining the Patreon and supporting the channel so I can keep making videos like this. Either way, thanks for watching. I'll see you next time. <laughs>